Louise Hay film, Greg Braden interview, take one. I was trained as a scientist. My background's in the, in the hard sciences, physical sciences, the earth sciences. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, when I received that training, there was no, uh, no room for the possibility of the kind of things that, that we're talking about now, the kinds of things that suggest that our inner world and our inner thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs in any way affect the world around us. Uh, and it was through direct experience uh, what I began to understand was that this is the great secret that everyone knows except us in the West. Uh, almost any other culture that we go to from uh, uh, the monasteries in Egypt and, uh, and Tibet and India and Bolivia and Peru, the indigenous traditions, little villages in the Andes Mountains, they all know that there is this experience that we can have inside of our bodies that affects our world in some way and our science simply uh, has not allowed for that historically. Well, I was trained as a scientist and I was trained to look in the world around me for my answers. So I began to go to these places. I began to go into the monasteries, uh, uh, all the places that I mentioned. And it was through the direct experience of, uh, of sitting in the presence of people who have lived and practiced uh, the, the kinds of traditions, that Louise Hay and the, the, the other authors I'm, I'm so blessed to be sharing this, uh, the stage and this information with, that they, they teach about. And what we begin to understand is that this is the place where science got it wrong. There are two places, two assumptions that science has made, modern science, uh, and they're, they're coming full circle and correcting that now, but the first one is that the space that we believe is empty is not really so empty. It's, it's full of a, of a living essence, of a living material that we're only beginning to understand, number one. And number two, the fact, and it is a fact now, that we may have experiences inside of our bodies that influence the world beyond our bodies through the conduit of what's in this space. So it was in going into the monasteries and the nunneries and speaking with the indigenous people, looking at them eye to eye, heart to heart, God to God, and I could say to these people, when you just perform that miracle, when you just perform that miraculous healing, what is it that you did inside of your body to make that happen? And if I didn't understand what they told me, I'd ask them again and again and again through the translators until I understood that they were creating an experience, producing an effect inside of their bodies that my science never told me was possible or, or existed. And that was the path that led me. I, and I, I just want to emphasize, science is good. And uh, I believe our science is good and served us well. It simply is incomplete. And so it was that path uh, that allowed me to flesh out the missing pieces that uh, we're only beginning to understand today, marrying the best science of our time with the wisdom, 5,000 years of wisdom of, of our past, uh, into a greater understanding. And that understanding brings us right back to the question, that's a long answer to a short question, but it's, it's, it brings us back to where, where we're only now beginning to understand that there is something that we can do in our lives that influence not only the, the physical body, uh, ours and, and those of other people around us, but, but literally influence the physical reality of our world. And that changes everything. It changes everything that we in the West believe about ourselves. So as a scientist, I've also come to understand this is a very different way for many people to think about themselves and their world. And, uh, and I've found that there is a, there's a learning curve that our audiences and our friends and families and co-workers in my career at the Water Fountain, this is not something that people typically talk about in a, a technical organization. They don't wake up in the morning and say, what kinds of feelings, what kinds of dreams, what kinds of healings did you have over the weekend? And they're talking about uh, who won the football game and who won the lotteries. But this is, this is where it brings us, uh, the relevance in our lives, because we all are having experiences every day whether we are consciously aware of it or not, those experiences are physically affecting our bodies and our world. What Western science now is beginning to understand, only in the last years of the 20th and now the first years of the 21st century, it is now a scientific fact that the, the space between things is anything but empty. It is full of a, a living, pulsating essence that is so new scientists have yet to agree on a single term. Some are calling it a quantum hologram, very technical sounding name. Um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the former Apollo astronaut, I've had the honor of sharing a stage with him a number of times. He calls it nature's mind. Stephen Hawking calls it the mind of God. Others simply call it the field. In 1944, the father of quantum physics, Max Planck, 
identified the existence of this field and he called it the matrix. He said underlying everything that we see, our bodies included, everything we see in the world around us in our bodies, he said there is the existence of, of what must be a conscious and intelligent mind. This is his language in 1944. He said that this mind is the matrix of all matter and it's from his work at the movie series uh, began and, and uh, many of the ideas that we have today. So what we know is this, is that we have the opportunity to influence that field in ways now that we're only beginning to understand. It's done through the human heart. It's not a thinking process. Thoughts are important. The ancients made the distinction between thoughts and feelings and emotions. And it's the feelings that are, are centered in our heart, what are called coherent, heart-based emotions. We know that when we feel a feeling, of love, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, we change the self-esteem. Uh, that there is an effect from that, that it changes the electrical and the magnetic fields in our heart and that those fields literally change the stuff that our world is made of uh, around our bodies. Our hearts are the strongest magnetic field in, in our bodies and our, our hearts are the strongest electrical field in our bodies, much more so than the brain. While the brain does create those kinds of fields, the heart is many times stronger. And what the science now is showing is that when you can change the field that the atom is in, you change the atom. And we're made of those atoms. So when we have feelings in our hearts, we're changing the field uh, that connects the stuff everything is made of. And we literally are altering our physical reality in ways that sound miraculous uh, in Western science. But again, this is the great secret everyone knows except us because Western science has only arrived at this understanding you go to these ancient and indigenous traditions and cultures, it's where they begin. They begin with the understanding, sure, everything's connected, and sure, we're part of it. And then they take us one step further, and they say, here, I'll show you. I'll show you how to create the, the effects in your body so that you, can, that you can heal your body, and you can heal the bodies of others. You can change your self-esteem, and your body will mirror that change. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long, slow, drawn-out process. It can happen uh, very, very quickly. It can happen in a matter of minutes. We have, uh, we have video documentation uh, from medicineless hospitals in Beijing, China, for example, where they understand these practices and they've employed them uh, for, for several thousand years. And we can look into the body of a living woman with a cancerous tumor that Western science says is inoperable. And then we can watch as three practitioners that understand the language of human emotion. They create the feeling in their bodies. They're not looking at that tumor as an illness. They see that woman as whole, healthy, vital, completely enabled, fully capacitated. And as they feel that feeling strongly among themselves, her physical body mirrors that. And we can see it through sonograms. We can see that tumor disappear in less than three minutes. And that's how quickly reality can change. And this is where the disconnect comes in with Western science. Because I've shared this information with scientists and medical doctors all over the world, and they said, wow, that's a miracle. We're going to have to come back and study this, and we will as soon as we find a cure for cancer, or as soon as we, we find the, 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 the cure to cure on a mechanical level, what they see as a mechanical process. And what we now know is, is our physical body is the outpicturing, uh, is, is the mirror of something that is not so physical. And this is, this is where science now is, is only arriving. The three practitioners in the medicineless hospital in Beijing did not judge that cancerous tumor. They didn't judge it right, wrong, good, or bad. They said it's a quantum possibility and there are many possibilities. Of course, this is just one. They said now we're going to choose another one. But this is a subtle and very, very different way of looking at things because they acknowledge what is and invite a new possibility rather than having a charge on, on what is there and feeling that somehow we have to manipulate or cut out in the case of a tumor uh, or change, the hammer the physical reality into submission, what they're doing is acknowledging that, that moment, that example, and they're changing it on the, the level of what we would call the quantum blueprint. They're feeling the feeling as if another possibility has, has occurred and in doing so, allowing that possibility to replace the one that exists without judging the one that exists.